To God be the glory. I want everybody to give shout to the Lord. Give Christ the glory. Thank you. Remain standing. Remain standing. I want you to look at your neighbor right now and smile at them and say, you must be a genius. Because you decided to sit next to me. You must be a genius. And then now get some attitude and say, because this is where the glory is going to fall, right here, where I'm standing. And so you must be a genius. I uh, don't believe in opening remarks. I believe you just start preaching. There's something about when the body of Christ gets together that we have forgotten. And it is this. The Bible says, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. And in the Bible, there was a moment where one group didn't get it at all, his hometown. And then later in that same chapter, they got it. It says they were offended at him in the early part of Mark 6. And then it says they recognized him and ran, began to carry others to wherever they heard he was. It was like they looked at him and said, stay right here. I'm going to be back with my crippled child. I'm going to be back in a few moments with somebody that is in desperate need. The church used to believe that. We used to believe that Sunday morning was a gathering where we can proudly affirm to the world we are the only movement in the history of the world where the founder attends every meeting. So if he's here, let's say, look at me. If he's here, right, then all things are possible. Shout. Shout. The Bible says that they arrested Peter for preaching the gospel. And they said, you're no longer allowed to speak in this name. The irony of that is that a man who was a quadriplegic got up and walked in front of everybody. And it said that everybody knew him and everybody understood that this was a miracle. They even said themselves, what are we gonna do with these men? For in fact, an extraordinary miracle has taken place through them. It's public knowledge and clearly evident to all the residents of Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. So in the next verse they say, we gotta stop them. Does that not make your brain just start to hurt? You just said that this was an undeniable miracle. Undeniable. And yet, we're going to do everything we can to stop it. I'm going to talk to you about the modern version of that that's going on right now and how we are going to get our country back. Come on. I want you to be seated. Thank you very much. The Bible says that we're to pray for those who are in leadership, doesn't it? It's a very hard discipline, but every day I pray for my President Trump. I do. <laughs> By the way, that was testing you to see if I was going to be okay with this group or not. And I see down here a t-shirt, revival driven. Yeah, all right. You've been in our tent. <laughs> Thank yeah, brother. Yeah. 
Yep, we're going to be back May the 15th. Yeah, we are. Well, I wish everybody was that excited. Yeah. Speaking of excited, one day I met a young woman and I said, God, that's my wife right there. I didn't waste any time. Some of you men need some lessons here on this stuff. Well, I don't know. I'm afraid of commitment. Listen, dude, get off that soy right now. Be a man. Amen. Be a man. So I met her. I knew she was the one, and I couldn't wait. And we've been married, and it's hard to believe that this woman and I have a 32-year-old son, 33-year-old son. But I'd like you to greet my wife, Michelle. Would you stand right now? Yeah. How many of you want the truth today, do you? I uh, am a sweet person. I found that out when my wife said it in the kitchen one day. She walked up to me and looked at me and said, you are the sweetest man in the world. And when she walked away, I could hear her muttering, and she spoke those things that were not as if they were. How many of you want the word today? Raise your hand. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. I met your pastors in Batavia. And James and Tracy came all the way up to a tent crusade where the rain never stopped. Doing a tent crusade in the rain makes as much sense as a screen door on a submarine. <laughs> and uh, they saw the miracles, they saw the crowds. I was as shocked as they were. And because of Ron McIntosh, who is an instigator. I know you know Ron, but you don't realize he is an instigator. And because of him, this whole thing today is happening. And that's why I thank God for Ron He's been a friend of mine since the year 19, none of your business. <laughs> Let's get busy. We need miracles, signs, and wonders. Look at me right now. We need miracles, signs, and wonders. But... There's been a perceivable drop in the power level in the body of Christ. I had the honor of working with Miss Kuhlman. I had the honor of spending time, because again, with Ron's help, of being with Oral Roberts, who I esteem to be the greatest man of God of the 20th century. I have been around those who operated in the supernatural and understood healing. And today, in that arena, the tail is wagging the dog. We are glorifying the features of emotion, but not the miracle that ought to induce the emotion. One day I saw this sign. I'm glad that I didn't say it. I was not the one who said this. But it said, the problem with women in America is they get excited over nothing, and then they marry him. Wow, am I glad I didn't say that. <laughs> but I believe the church gets excited over nothing. And I believe we've traded the sublime and the miraculous and the wonderful for almost the absurd. That is why this church is growing. Because I don't know if you realize that this church is breaking all the rules, all of the rules. Yeah, all of them. And they're breaking the rules because they're excited. And because every day there's a report of healing. I was in the green room and I was watching the testimonies of the people that are healed in this church every week. So that the miraculous is a regular part of this church. 
God healing the sick is a big deal in this church. Now let me ask you something. How many of you want more signs, wonders, and miracles? No, really, do you? I was led of the Lord to preach the gospel. I've been preaching the gospel over 50 years. And the Lord gave us one of the most astonishing revivals in the University of California at Berkeley, where the intellectuals, the atheists, were getting saved. The first core of our team in Berkeley were 17 Jewish atheists that came out of the Bolt School of Law, which was the law school at Berkeley. And they were converted and formed their own separate group because we knew they were radioactive. And they were called the Lions of Judah. And these young people revolutionized. Then we had members of the Oakland Police Department, which is right next to Berkeley, and members of the Black Panther Party saved. Now that sounds great until you add the fact these are two groups of people that were in a gun battle against each other that stood on the stage and confessed Christ. And so for years, I won young people. That's what I do. Our crowds remain young. I don't do anything special for that. It's just God has graced us that young people want to hear me speak. Now, I don't get it. Some of you young people are saying, neither do we. But it is absolutely true. Now, years go by. All of the people I started with are talking about retiring. You know, they're getting ready to gum applesauce at Leisure World. And I'm not having it. I don't know what's wrong with me. My wife is waiting for me to slow down a little bit. But she is as adamant about winning souls as I am. So one day I went to bed, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, I asked the people at 9.30 the same question, what is up with God at 3 o'clock in the morning? How many of you has God awakened you at 3 in the morning? See? All my friends are retiring. The Lord says, study the youth culture. I was in the middle of the anti-war movement. I was, I was, as a high school student, preaching in the Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco. So now the Lord said, once again, you start day one of school to study the American youth culture, specifically what is happening to them who's doing it to them, why it is happening. It was the most painful research of my life. And at the end of it, I felt like God was torturing me by doing this research. And on the final night, I'm sitting in a hotel room reading a final article about the American youth when I feel evil walk into my hotel room. The temperature dropped, the evil was so pervasive, and I could hear this insidious voice in my spirit. I will humiliate them. I will destroy them. I will drive them out of their minds. I'm going to have them. I'm going to chew them up. I'm going to spit them out. And all of a sudden, the glory of God swallowed up the evil, and I heard God roar, but I will pour out my spirit on them. Now, I'm, I'm going to try it again. But I will pour out my spirit on them. Somebody give God the glory. If you believe that, give the Lord a shout right now. And so, the Holy Spirit 
began to deal with me about starting all over again. And I went to preach in Stockton, California, and on a hot summer afternoon in the Central Valley of California, after a morning service, I went and took a nap. I was going to preach a rally that night. And all of a sudden, I had a dream. And in that dream, I was hovering over the state of California. And I saw Highway 99. And Highway 99 begins at Red Bluff, California, just south of Redding, extends 425 miles, 45 miles below Bakersfield at Laval Road. And as I stood over the state in the dream, that highway turned into a river. And God said, Highway 99 is a corridor of my glory. Now, I've been led to cities, but never to a highway. And the Lord said, you're going to do meetings up and down this highway. And then I began to know why. It was the most victimized section of California. In 2010, the top five worst places to live in America were all along that highway. Number one in, in uh, foreclosure. Number one in drunk driving. The, the state of California cut off their water to the farmers over a snail that long. The state tricked them into borrowing money and then killed them in 2008 until thousands of people in the Central Valley left their keys on the kitchen counter and walked away. Their dreams shattered forever. Gang violence, the, state, the cartels in Mexico skipped LA and moved into Bakersfield. One of my friends at Bakersfield is Manuel Carrizales, who leads Stay Focused Ministry. Last year, he personally performed 72 funerals for young men shot in drive-by shootings. And the Lord said, this is where my glory is going to be poured out. There's a gang you've heard of, MS-13, Bloods, Crips, all of them in L.A. We now have approximately 250,000 gang members in Southern California. Now, you go up to, up and down that area, and it'd be the last place on earth you'd want to preach. 10,000 homeless in Fresno. It's a mess. But God said, you're going to get a tent. And I got a tent given to me. The person who gave it to me didn't know anything about it. 1,000 chairs and a tent. We chose one park. It's called Fink White Park. It is a gang center in Fresno. It is so violent that no one is on the streets at night in that neighborhood. Nobody. And the Lord said, put up your tent in the middle of it. We put up our tent, and everybody fought us. Pastors fought us. The city fought us. This is before the pandemic. They fought us. Tooth and nail. You can't go. Can't put up this tent. People are going to get killed if you go. The police said, do you realize... You're in the murder center of Fresno right now. And the Holy Ghost kept saying, put up the tent because you're not going to see murder. You're not going to see death. You're going to see the glory of God. <laughs> Clap for the Lord. Amen. Oh, we did. Well, ultimately, the tent was packed out. And people began to be saved and healed. The Lord said, now move the tent. We moved the tent, and the crowds got bigger. We moved, now we've been in Bakersfield, Fresno, Modesto, Sacramento, and we're weeks away. This is why you're getting the chiefest compliment, the highest compliment any church could ever get, is my wife will tell you that right now, I'm in the prayer closet getting ready for the largest tent crusade we've ever done. You know, listen. And, uh, but something's going to happen in this city right here. Something big is going to happen. Get excited right now. So, the miracles of healing, the unsaved that were converted and filled with the Spirit. God began to use Fink White, the tent meeting, 
This is the single miracle that set it all in motion. A young man, 19 years old, his name is Joe, was driving to his job as a pizza delivery man. This 19-year-old is an addict, a heroin addict. His father introduced him to heroin. The despair was so thick in that area where they lived that the father said, you need this just to survive. Put him on drugs. He's on his way to his job in a pizza parlor when he sees the tent by the side of the road, Highway 99. And a voice says, get in that tent. So he pulls over, calls his job, says 4.30 in the afternoon, calls his job and he says, uh, I can't come to work today, I gotta go to this tent. And his boss said, well, you're fired if you don't show up. He said, well, I guess I'm fired. And so he gets there and as you know, because you were in Batavia, people show up early. Sometimes we have to start an hour early. So he sat there at 4.30 in the tent, pretty quick we started, and I walk out, and he was seated, what would have been like this fourth row over here in the aisle. And the Lord said, that young man's a heroin addict, he has liver disease, he has kidney disease, and he's unsaved, and I want you to glorify me in front of everybody. I said, that's easy for you to say. <laughs> so I fought it, and fought it. Power of God comes on me. I w How many of you are getting blessed so far, are you? Because, all right. So I walked down there. I looked at him. I said, young man, stand up. I said, what's your name? He said, Joe. I said, Joe, you are addicted to heroin, aren't you? He said, yes. I said, you have kidney disease, don't you? He said, yes, I do, sir. I said, you have liver disease. My wife was there, watched the whole thing. Well, I said, Joe, you have something called a demonic spirit. It's on you. That's what your problem is. How many of you believe the church needs to quit playing games and get down to business with this stuff? You know, just get down to business. So I said, this thing's coming out of you right now, and it did. And then I said, now you need to get saved. So get born again, and he's born again. And I said, now you're being healed in your body. And he could feel the power of God going through his body. So now his liver is healed, his kidneys are healed, his taste for heroin is gone. Now, so I turn around like any evangelist would do, and I do a little victory march. Whoa, that's great. And God said, where are you going? You're not done yet. Something that would alter our tent crusades forever. I turned around, went to him, and he, I, looked, I said, son, I'm going to put my hand on your head, and you're going to feel something in your belly come up out of your mouth. It is going to be a language you don't know because you're about to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Lord, somebody give God the glory. So, I put the mic down by his mouth. That's how much faith I had. And that language broke out. It's crystal clear. It filled the entire tent with the glory of God. And I'm going to tell you, God told me 99. I've been stuck on the 99. We had to go from our 8,000 square foot tent to now we own and just are putting up in a few days a 19,000 square foot tent because of how many are being saved. Yeah. We'll be able to seat thousands. The churches are unified in the valley like I've never seen before. Look at this verse. Everybody look at the verse. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Everybody put your hand on your heart. Say this out loud. I'm not just a believer. Say, I am not just a believer. I am a weapon. I am a weapon. You believe that? 
Now, I want you to look at me right now. Everybody said amen. Say amen. Say amen. All of you in the back also say amen. amen. Look, I love that. Don't bring politics into the pulpit. You've all heard it. Here's the problem with that. It makes as much sense as a pregnant pole vaulter. Do you know what I did for years? I preached against drugs because they were evil. I preached against gangs because they were violent. And then they jumped into our yard. I didn't go after the politicians. They came after us. We didn't bring this fight to them. They brought it to us. They went after your child. Somebody help me. I'm going to, no, you're not helping me enough. I'm going to work you a little bit. They went after your child. They went after your freedom. They went after your faith. And the churches in America never should have shut their doors, not even for a minute. Somebody help me right now. Behold their threat. We're not beholding the threat. The pastor who's in his pulpit not talking about this is avoiding the threat, denying the threat, looking at it. And I asked one. He looked at me and he said, Mario, you've gone completely crazy. You are nothing now but a politician. That's all you are now is a politician. And I looked at him and I said, why are you not condemning abortion from your pulpit? Why are you not standing for marriage between a man and a woman? And I'm going to ask you, I said, you are not talking about it. We've got a, a maternal holocaust going on in America that would make Hitler blush. And I said, why aren't you condemning it? He said, I would lose members. That's why. I said, you mean you would lose votes? I said, you're the politician, not me. But the answer isn't political. The answer, we must win elections. We got to win them. We're not going to get rid of this mess until we win them. I'm from California. I'm telling you, they have destroyed the state. I grew up in San Francisco. And the leftists in San Francisco have done more harm than the 1906 earthquake. They've destroyed that city, and they're not going to stop. They're not even looking to see if it works. But here's the deal. How many of you want the answer to what's going on in America right now? Raise your hand. Do you really? Now, here's what he said. Lord, behold their threat, and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may preach your word. Today is the day for pastors to get in the pulpit and say, I don't care what the press thinks. Don't care what CNN says. Don't care what my denomination says. I'm going to tell the public what the Holy Spirit is telling me to preach from my pulpit. I'm going to tell them. And I'm going to... How many of you are ready for that? And if you're not, There's something bad going to happen to the churches that don't wake up and start speaking the truth. Because America is getting sick of this whole mess right now. And it's time. And here's what the Bible says. Grant unto your servants that with all boldness we may preach your word while you stretch out your hand to heal and let signs and wonders be done in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Now, I'm about to say something, and many of you don't know me, and you don't understand the story behind this statement. But we are now past words. America's beyond words. We're yelling at each other. We don't have civil discourse. There is no openness to describe things. Now... We need the supernatural power of God to be demonstrated in front of everybody. 
That's what we need. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. And it begins by a miracle in you. Put your hand over your heart again. Say, I have a right to speak. And nobody can take away my freedom of speech. Clap real loud if you believe that. Clap. Let me hear you. Nobody. So now we get to the next point. The Bible says that this man hadn't walked, and everybody knew him. Ladies and gentlemen, he was in the best begging spot in all of Jerusalem. He was in front of the temple walking in right before everybody was going to pray. And when people are in the mood to pray, they're also in the mood to give. He had it made. But one day, Peter stood there, and I'm going to tell you what he was doing. And I want all of you to understand this. We have got to have pastors in America get rid of their fear. Fear of money, fear of being rejected, fear of people leaving their church. We got to get them over this. We got to help them understand it's no fun being a slave to the fear of man. It's not fun. It's no way to live. Now, I've got to get this point across somehow. So Peter is standing there, and there's a reason that he walked by him day after day after day after day. They had gone to pray every day, and at the same hour, they would walk past the same man. And when the man saw Peter, he automatically raised his cup and expected money from them. Why? Because they were feeding the kitty. And why would Peter hesitate? Even after he's filled with the Spirit, why would he hesitate to lay hands on this man and get him healed? Because he remembered something Jesus said. He said, when you were young, you went where you wanted to. And when you were old, someone else will wrap your outer garment and take you where you would not go. You're going to die a martyr, Peter. You're going to die a martyr. He said, let's get clear the air. That's how you're going out. And so Peter did the math. Whenever Jesus talked, everything was fine. But when he did a miracle, they wanted to kill him. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, they had a special meeting. And they said, we know this is a resurrection. It's a miracle. We know that God has sent him. We even know that he's the Messiah. But if we don't stop him, we're going to lose our political position. There's no modern example of that. No, there isn't. Of course there is. Doctors need to be ashamed. Medical professionals need to be ashamed because they know what's going on. They know that Big Pharma is controlling this entire mess. They know it. They know it. They know that there are alternatives to getting well from this disease. There are other ways. Thank God for the church. We can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now let me turn over to this. Let's, let's take, am I preaching yet? So now, here comes this moment. We know that these alternative natural things and other drugs that we've discovered will work. You don't have to be a guinea pig and take an experiment in your body and in your children's body. This will work, but no, they won't for the same reason that they had to stop Jesus. You tell me why the borders are open. You know, we deal with the homeless in California. The homeless can't get free medical help. The homeless 
American citizens in L.A. cannot get help. But if you get in here illegally, you are put on a bus, you're given a free hotel room, and you're told that you'll get all the medical help you need. Why? Because we're being repopulated, and they believe they're going to vote a certain way. They're going to stay in power. They wanted to kill Christ because he raised the dead, and he's going to take over Israel because he's the king of Israel. And now we got to stop him. The same thing is going on right now. And every pastor who's afraid to get up and say, this is not Christianity, this is not America, the Bible recognizes two genders. The Bible recognizes freedom in the land. The Bible, and we will not, somebody help me out. Oh, it's not going on like it is in the Bible. I want you to look at something. Look at Acts 4, 16. What are we going to do with these men? Well, the fact is an extraordinary miracle has taken place through them. It's public knowledge, clearly evident to all the residents of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. We cannot deny it. Now look at verse 17. But, <laughs> I don't think, it, I'm going to try it again. It works, it heals, it does the job, it's a miracle, it's from God, but. So it spreads no further among the people. Let us severely threaten them. This is CNN's favorite verse, by the way. <laughs> that from now on they speak no more in this name. So look at the prayer. Acts, go back to verse 429, 429. What did they tell him to do? Don't say anything about Jesus anymore and no more healings. So Peter's immediate reaction is, Lord, look on their threat and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may spread your word, speak your word. When the government came to a, a preacher and said, shut down your church, you're a super spreader. <laughs> How many of you will give me a minute to explain something? How many of you will? How many of you give me five more minutes to preach? Rachel? All right. Leave your hand up, 5, 10, 15, no. <laughs> Dad, I'm acting like a liberal now. <laughs> Governor Gavin Newsom in California closed all five of our 10 crusades. He didn't just close them. It was like a personal grudge. Suddenly, we were at the uh, Chico Silver Dollar Fairgrounds. We were at the... Pa Placer County Fairgrounds. We're at the Fresno County Fairgrounds. We were at the fairgrounds in Bakersfield. We had five of them. Every one of them called us up and said, we were just told you cannot do a tent crusade on our property. You are banned. And I was devastated. My wife will tell you, I went into something I don't ever want to feel again. Three o'clock in the morning, I see the most devastated face I've ever seen. It was a man that I saw in the spirit, addict, homeless, diseased, lost, trembling on the verge of death. And he looked at me and he said, if you want to, you can come and help me. And the Lord said, that man is in Fresno right now. Most devastated city. Well, let me tell you. The Lord said, get out of bed and study Matthew 7 and 8. Matthew 7 says, 
If you being eagle, evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your father will give you gifts. Then he said, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. So now, Matthew chapter 7 is being preached on a mountain. Down at the bottom of that mountain, look me in the eye, is a leper. Hearing Jesus say, your heavenly father will give you good gifts. I'm not just a leper, I'm a child of God. It's wafing down off the mountain. He hears, you're supposed to ask. But it's against the law for a leper to talk to, let alone touch, an undiseased person. Social distancing, right? So Jesus comes down off the mountain, and this leper almost attacks him, saying, if you want to, you can heal me. Where did he get that? He just heard it on the mountain. He said, look. I know I'm supposed to behave myself and have nothing to do with you, but I've gotten it in me that I'm not a disease. I'm a human being. I'm a child of God. I'm worth something. I'm not supposed to live in hell every day of my life. And so he broke the law and touched Christ. And Christ turned around and broke the law I'm waiting on a Pentecostal crowd here. I'm waiting on them. And he said, I will heal you. And God said, you go to Fresno and help that man. And you break the law, son. I want you to break the law. I said, what? I said, God, I like this. I'm feeling good. I like people like that, you know? A good friend is somebody that will bail you out of jail at 3 o'clock in the morning, right? You can call them up, hey, come get me. But a best friend is sitting in the cell next to you saying, wasn't that fun? And that's Frank Saldana, right? Frank Saldana, my right-hand man, the, the man who's better with the homeless than anybody in America, the guy who puts up our tent and his team inner city action and you're wearing the shirt they help us so i called frank i said we're going to fresno he said yes we are brother we're going to Fresno." i said we're going to break the law he said i can't wait <laughs> he said brother don't make it a misdemeanor make it a felony we got to make it a felony There's a park in Fresno, it's beautiful, it's large. It's soccer field, baseball stadium. It's called Granite Park. And Granite Park was once owned by the city, but a businessman bought it. Thank God for businessmen. Thank God for, for people who buy things. So the management of the Granite Park in Fresno, we called them on the phone. They said, we would like to do a tent crusade during a lockdown. And he said, they said to us, you know what? It's about time. It's about time. Yeah. We started the volunteer army, and now we have a volunteer army. You see two of them right there. We keep messing with them today. But in California, we asked for volunteers for our latest crusade. So far, 1,400 people are coming to California to help us in the Central Valley. It's an incredible miracle. All right, thank you. Now, I gotta stop. I've gone way over my time and I am preaching tonight, so I'm gonna tell you in a conclusion. It, but the conclusion has 32 sub-conclusions. You know, don't you love it when preachers are honest? We went to Fresno. We put up our tent, we put out 30,000 invitations on the streets in, uh, right, and knowing that it was against the law to have a public meeting. We said, we're gonna do it. 
And someone said, well, you're breaking the law. I said, no, actually, Gavin Newsom is breaking the law. Because the U.S. Constitution is the law of the land. And it says you will not make any law that will restrict the free exercise of religion. So we opened the meeting, and it was three times the size of our previous crusade in Fresno. And the miracles were amazing. Now, tonight, something's going to happen. This is not hype, it's a warning. I looked at the TV guide. Everything on tonight is stupid. You will literally lose IQ points <laughs> if you stay home. But I need you to come to this meeting and help me. I need you to come, not as a spectator, but as a soldier. What we need in the barn tonight, no more religion, no more talk, but signs, wonders, and miracles by the power of Jesus Christ. That's what we need. I'm really angry, I admit it. I'm very angry. Because what we see is them saying in one verse, oh, it's true, it's wonderful, it's miracles, it's undeniable, but we gotta stop it. It's exactly what our government is saying. They're saying it to marriage. We know marriage is wonderful, we still have to destroy it. We know that gender is wonderful, but we still have to destroy it. And it's only for one thing, because there's a handful of elite demon-possessed devils up in Washington that believe they are supposed to control our lives. And the answer is revival and a vote. Revival and a vote. We gotta throw these bums out. Throw them out. We gotta throw them out. Mara, that's not very loving. Let me repeat. In love, we got to throw the bums out. Now, where do we got to be? Peter walked by the man every day. He didn't want miracles because he knew that he would be martyred. Once the miracle started, he'd be arrested. If he healed the sick, he'd be arrested. That's exactly the spirit that denominational leaders are trying to put on pastors. If you take a stand for morality and miracles, you're gonna be persecuted, don't do it. Be woke. So, Peter walked by every day, and one morning, he left his money for the cripple, the paraplegic, on the dresser. He didn't have money. We have it wrong. We see him this way, like Charlton Heston. Silver and gold have I not. Didn't go down like that. Went down like this. Hang on a second. You know I'm good for it. I... He started searching. He's got no money. And he starts to feel terrible. And he starts to realize what he's doing is what American pastors are doing. He was paying that man and he was renting days of powerless ministry. He was trading power for safety. And there's nothing more dangerous than safety outside the will of God. And the frustration grew and grew until Peter was ashamed. And he finally, he said, silver and gold have I none. None! And I'm glad I don't have it, and I never should have been dependent on it. St. Francis of Assisi, who had a healing ministry, went to visit the Pope. And the Pope showed him all the wealth of the Vatican. And then he snickered at him and said, well, 
Saint, he said, Francis, no longer can the church say, silver and gold have I none. And he said, and neither can it say, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Now, Peter looks at him and says, never should have had this. We got to do it the same way. American church, listen to me. Fresh out of psychiatry. Fresh out of Madison Avenue marketing. Fresh out of politics, out of speaking, positive confession, mingling Islam with Christianity, creating Chrislam. Done. No new age, no trinkets, no toys, no games, no more. In the name of Jesus, America, get up and walk. Shout! Somebody shout right now. Somebody shout right now. If you could bow your heads for a moment, you may be seated, all of you. A moment of... This is where so many part ways with me. Is when I say, you know, I have never found it difficult to move from addressing and rebuking the political spirit in America to giving an altar call. It's an easy transition. Because the gospel speaks against evil. The, the gospel attacks evil. The gospel sets people free. We must be delivered from the idea that we have an embarrassing, shy message that ought to be dispensed in safe doses. We have the message. You're not serious about ending racism if you leave Christ and the testimony of Christianity out of the racial debate. You're not serious about women's rights if you leave out the gospel of Christ and the testimony of what Christianity is meant to women throughout the world and throughout history. You're not serious about social justice if you leave Christ out. And I will say to the psychiatric community, you don't want people to be mentally healthy if you leave God out of the story. So I'm going to ask you where you are right now to receive life. I know that I've said a lot of things that seem to be exclusively zeroed toward the Christian, but they weren't. They were for everybody. These remarks are for everyone that would love life. Mara, I love my children. If you love your children, you will understand that the first thing you want to give them is a Christian parent, a Christian mom and dad, a true Christian. If you're a man in this room and you say, I love my children, but you're not walking with God, you're actually hurting your children. You're not giving them. You've put a roof over their head, food in their mouth, clothes on their body, and you've set aside a trust fund. But you have left out the one thing that your child needs the most, and that's to know God and to see God in you. And... Your wife shouldn't be the spiritual leader of the home. She shouldn't be the one that's pushing everyone to pray. You should be the catalyst to lead prayer, Bible study, go to church. We shouldn't make it an idea that there's something feminine about moving a family to go to church. The man ought to do that. So important that you see what's wrong with you. Mario, I, I read the Bible, I pray, and yet my life has not changed. My spirit has not been altered. That's because of what Jesus said, except a seed fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. When you prayed and asked God to help you, you didn't pray right. Because you're asking God to assist you in your plan and assist you 
in the things you like. You're asking God to serve you. Right now, you need to ask God one question. I want to do your will. Reveal yourself to me for my part in the great drama of these days. You're doing something in the earth, and I don't know what it is, and I'm not a part of it, and I don't understand my assignment, and I don't get where I belong, and it's hurting you. It keeps you awake at night. It affects your health, your immune system, your emotions. Nothing is more central to the joy and peace of a life than when you realize, I don't believe that Jesus just saves, but he's my Lord, and he's the master of my existence. Now, I'm going to ask you to be honest. Look inside your heart. Mara, depression is there that ought not to be there. Loneliness is there that ought not to be there. Fear of the future is there that ought not to be there. And I need new life. So wherever you are and whoever you are, let me pray with you for a new life. Let me pray for you. It won't look like Joe. You're not a heroin addict necessarily. It, whether you are or you aren't, it's irrelevant. You will have the same miracle that Joe did of coming from darkness into life, of coming from pain into absolute peace. Now let me pray for you. What do I mean by that? You and I are going to agree in prayer. Maybe you've said, you know, I don't know if God hears my prayer. I've tried so many times. Say this in your heart, according to the word of God, if any two of you shall agree as touching anything on earth, it will be done. This time, the change you want in your life will come because it's starting in heaven. That's why Paul said in Philippians, it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. This time, God, I'll break the habit by the power of God. This time, the seed will stick and I will walk with God successfully because it's starting from you and not from me. Now, if will you respond to God's plea? Will you respond to the offer that God is making to you right now? I'm going to give you a new life. Let me have your life. Now, if you'll let me pray with you for that, let me see your hand right now, wherever you are. If you will let me pray with you. I'd like those of you that immediately put your hand in the air, stand on your feet. Get up on your feet wherever you are. Man, do I feel the power of God. Do I feel the power of God. Now I want you to look at me, just those who are standing. You've just done something very brave and very wise. What you've just done you will never regret as long as you live. You will always mark this moment down and say, that's when everything's changed for me. Now, would you get out of your seat where all of you are standing, walk down here to the front, and everybody clap to welcome them to the front. Come on. Then I'm going to ask... I want to say to the rest of the audience, this service went real long because you're a long-winded audience. But I want you to point your arm toward the front. I'm going to say a couple things before we pray with these people. Be mature today. This is how God blesses a church, is by winning souls in that church. This is how a church knows it's blessed of God, is when you see this. Second, they're going to receive an offering for the church, so please hold steady. I really believe God wants to fund a very special miracle in this church. And some of you are going to be led of the Lord to do something unique today financially. Because something big is on the horizon for Grow Church. 
and it has to do with miracles and souls. Put your hand over your heart. Look me right in the eye. You don't give your heart away every day. You don't do that every day. So you have to do it right. You have to do it right. The degree of my ability to give my heart away is predicated on the truth and the sincerity and the power of the person that I'm giving my heart to. They have to be utterly trustworthy. They can't be somebody that's going to hurt me. Now, you're going to say with your mouth, open your mouth, you're going to say these words after me. Why are we repeating this prayer? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth. So close your eyes and say this after me. And then pastor will have an urgent, so everybody hold steady and be calm. There'll be an urgent thing we need to do for these that have come forward. And then we will receive an offering for the church. But Father, help them. Say this with me out loud. In church, join in just because you're full of love. Jesus, I see you on the cross dying a horrible death. And it was for me. It was for my sins. And it was for my salvation. You won. You defeated evil. And today, evil will be defeated in me. When you died on the cross, you proved that you loved me. When you rose from the dead, you proved that you had the power to change everything about me. Take away my sin, washing me in your blood. Take away my fear, my doubt, my addictions, my evil thoughts, and set me free. I thank you, Jesus, that you have done this wonderful miracle. And I am yours now. And I belong to you. Everybody's silent for a moment. Listen to me. I'm sure that if I gave you the open door, you would give the loudest applause of the day. But I want you to hold it because something bigger than that is in play. Pastor is going to come and speak to you. He's going to instruct these that are here for a few moments. This service is at the end. You're only going to be here a few more minutes. But this is the part that's important. Hold steady because we're at the most important part right now. Thank you, Pastor.